October 9, 1967. Despite his surreptitious execution, the amputating of his hands for fingerprint testing, and his hasty burial next to an airfield runway, there was no hiding him. Che Guevara was to become one of the greatest legends and icons of the 20th century. The moment news of his death broke, the youth took to the streets everywhere, brandishing his portrait, thus setting it on its way to becoming one of the best known and most reproduced images in the world. Che Guevara was born in Rosario, Argentina to a middle-class family. He developed an early interest in social justice and political activism. In 1953, he completed his medical studies at the University of Buenos Aires, and during this time, he took part in various trips across Latin America, which exposed him to the poverty and inequality prevalent in the region. In 1955, Guevara met Fidel Castro, a fellow revolutionary in Mexico. To better grasp the birth of his legendary status, we need to trace Che step by step through his formative years, which began with his arrival in Cuba as a combat medic for the rebel army led by Fidel Castro. We need to follow him through the corridors of power in the aftermath of a revolution which was the first to be caught entirely on film. And from Beijing to Algiers, New York to Moscow, to understand the reasons why his face became a weapon in the international communication battle at the height of the Cold War. We finally need to analyze for what future and for what ideal Che, in the face of all opposition, sought tirelessly to manufacture his own legendary status, which he meant to survive him. So when and how was the legend of the Guerrero Heroico born? How did socialist theoreticians intend to use his image? And how was Ernesto Guevara finally trapped by this self? In Cuba, everything always begins in the Sierra Maestra. Almost 10 years to the day before Che's death, a reporter covered the guerrilla warfare waged by Fidel Castro at a handful of revolutionaries against the dictatorial regime of Fulgencio Batista. The reporter wanted to hear the combatants' point of view. One of them caught his attention. Short, haired, an olive green cap, youthful looks, and a camera dangling from a strap. He didn't yet have the looks that would one day make him famous, but he was 29, a trainee doctor, and his brothers, in arms, were already calling him Che due to his frequent use of the filler sound, Che, in common use among Spanish speakers in Argentina. The report was Che Guevara's media baptism. This archive footage is well known, but people often forget to mention that in this, his first appearance on film, Che decided to introduce himself to the people of Cuba and the world, firstly by condemning the media. Durante todos los meses, ya son 16 los meses que hemos estado en la Sierra Maestra, han venido periodistas de muchas partes del mundo y se han preocupado de, de la parte, digamos, anecdótica de esta guerra de guerrilla. Hoy aprovecho la oportunidad de la visita de un periodista cubano para dar al pueblo de Cuba el primer saludo que tengo oportunidad de dar. The shot is cut here, so we don't have a chance to hear the deep reasoning behind his engagement, nor the guerrilla's overall revolutionary plan. Because the reason Che had chosen to join in this crazy venture was that he knew the dictator, Fulgencio Batista, was head of a puppet government backed by the United States, and that Cuba was only 90 miles away from the coast of Florida and living under America's control. For 50 years, the Pearl of the Caribbean had been America's playground and garden of delights, but also its main supplier of sugar, and with Guantanamo, one of its strategic military outposts. By fighting guerrilla warfare here, Che Guevara and his Cuban comrades believed not only could they orchestrate the triumph of social revolution on the island, but also by inflicting a first defeat on the imperial power of the United States, which paved the way to freedom for all other Latin American countries. In the meantime, Fidel Castro, who had promoted Che Guevara to commander, gave him the task of developing infrastructures which were for guerrilla warfare. Every assignment that was ever given to Che, it was because he was the right person, the best person for that job, uh, and because he had, he had distinguished himself in the fighting and in the, leader, and in the leadership. <laughs> 
On January 1, 1959, Fidel Castro launched an appeal for a general strike and proclaimed the triumph of the revolution. In the eyes of the Cuban people, Fidel was the figurehead of the insurgency. Far from the shimmering image he would later develop, for now Che remained firmly in the shadows. And even though he appeared before the flashbulbs and cameras of reporters now flocking around the rebel army, with all the distinctive symbols of the guerrilla in popular myth, the combat fatigues, cigar, black beret, sparse beard, and hair, his face was practically unknown. Since entering Havana, the eyes of Che Guevara and the other leaders of the revolution were fixed on the vast Cuban TV network, which would bring them into every living room. And even before the nationalization process was complete, they renamed the channels. After Radio Rebel, there was now Revolution TV, oh, si no, que la Radio, mano todos los Press, que TV. The Cuban Revolution could now engage the American enemy in its first battle, a battle of communication. Because the first assaults were launched in the media and concerned Che Guevara's new post, that of Chief Prosecutor and Commander of La Cabana Prison, where he would oversee the establishing of the Revolutionary Court. We must also remember that the brutality and corruption within the U.S., backed Batista regime, imposed on the Cuban population for years, had left very deep scars. Accompanied by cameramen, investigators discovered the instruments of torture used in the jails of the old regime and revealed the terrible crimes committed by the dictatorship. In the military fortress overlooking Havana Harbor, almost 2,000 people were imprisoned in front of the camera lenses. Che Guevara set up revolutionary tribunals on a similar basis to those established after World War II. The death sentences began to mount up, like for Cornelia Rojas, the former chief of the Santa Clara police. The footage shown on TV was meant to shock. Rumors began to circulate. The foreign press set alarm bells ringing and announced the thousands of seminary trials and executions. The U.S. Congress demanded an inquiry. Before the media, Che Guevara suddenly changed from being the prosecutor to the accused. As a response to disinformation, the revolutionary press published photos of the victims of Batista's regime and a full list of the names of 200 people sentenced to death. But criticism still intensified. So Fidel Castro decided to call for a mass rally at which he could defy the U.S. media in front of the international press. In Cuba, this media war was given the codename Operación Verdad, Operation Truth. To prove to the Cuban people and to the world that the trials respected all rights to legal defense and that the accused were genuinely guilty, Fidel Castro asked Che Guevara to organize on a single day, January 22, 1959, a long series of trials. But there was further controversy when the Cuban revolutionaries were accused of holding showcase trials like those which had been staged in Moscow. The first battle in the media war was lost. The name of Che Guevara was more widely known, but he had been given a new nickname by counter-revolutionaries, the Butcher of La Cabana. Fidel Castro suspended the trials. Fidel Castro appointed Che Guevara to a post less in the media spotlight, but just as important in the revolutionary process. President of the National Bank of Cuba. A strange appointment, that of a Guerrero medic heading a banking and financial institution. His first symbolic actions may have raised a smile, but they did allow him to be viewed in a more favorable light. He signed the, the Cuban banknotes from that point on with just Che. <laughs> I think it was a way of uh, expressing his contempt for money. This central role cast him into the spotlight. And although Che still seemed to remain in Castro's shadow at the signature for the nationalization of U.S. banks, it was he who became the star of news reports when, to avert the first economic retaliation measures established by the United States, agreements with the major socialist powers were concluded. 
The banker who smoked a banker's cigar but dressed in combat fatigues bemused his counterparts and the foreign press. But Che Guevara was still not a national hero. Nobody brandished his picture on May 1st, 1960, out on Revolution Square. And although personality cults did not exist in Cuba, people preferred to sculpt homemade busts of Jose Marti, the so-called Apostle of Cuban Independence, and where the portrait of Camilo Cienfuegos, he too a commander of the revolution, or more rarely, and not always over-flattering, that of Fidel Castro. The French freighter La Corbeau explodes in Havana Harbor. The Cuban TV headquarters and those of ISAIC, the Cuban Cinematographic Institute, were closed by. Their cameramen were among the first to arrive on the scene, and their footage, in which we can see Che Guevara, also quickly present, were seen all over the world. The next day, Che, Fidel, Raoul, Sartre, and Simone de Beauvoir, who were in Havana, also joined this march, marched down the avenue near the dock, joining hands and were photographed doing this. And then there was a moment when they stopped and on a stage spoke to the crowds that had gathered. Among the photographers present on the corner of 12th and 23 RD streets in the Vedato district, where a stage had been set up for Fidel Castro to make a speech, Alberto Diaz Gutierrez, also known as the photographer Corda, was working on a report for the Cuban newspaper Revolution. Corda was a fantastic photographer who had started out in advertising. He was taking some photos of the stage, and he said that all of a sudden he sensed the image of Che suddenly enter his lens. He had a reflex reaction and took the picture. The picture he took is this incredible, famous image of Chi looking as if into history itself, this look of the implacable revolutionary. This photo, which Corda entitled Guerrero Heroico, the heroic guerrilla fighter, didn't become famous immediately. Without anyone really noticing, it appeared several times in its definitive format. Like here, in the bottom corner of a page of revolution to announce a public conference to be given by Che. And yet, it was a time when Chi himself was emerging more and more. But that was less due to this photo than to the covers of Western magazines, which were the first to focus on him. French photographers and American reporters who were struck by his handsome good looks and charisma. Between ads and fashion reports, portraits of Che began to adorn the inside pages of U.S. weeklies. The prestigious Time magazine, no less, gave him the front cover and called him the brain of the revolution. The Eastern Bloc naturally began to show interest in Che Guevara, especially as, since the 20th Congress of the Communist Party and the denunciation by Krustin of the personality cult and its consequences in the Soviet Union, Moscow was seeking new figures to inspire the people. They tried with Raul Castro, who very early on had visited the USSR and had on his side the fact of being Fidel's brother. But you've got to admit, he did lack a bit of charisma. So the Soviets were very keen to meet this new figure from Cuba. During his trip, all the stops were pulled out. He was put on view and filmed, and a number of reports were dedicated to him. And the seduction was reciprocal. This exposure turned Che Guevara into a leading figure in a socialist camp and in third world countries. Vive la République Angélienne, démocratique et populaire, et son gouvernement But it was back in Cuba that Che Guevara, who in the meantime had been appointed Minister of Industries, had grown extremely popular. Cuba was caught in a vicious cycle. So within this context, the question facing the Minister of Industries now was how to convince the population to pursue its efforts. Because for Che, the stakes of this debate were much higher than finding a solution to a more or less transitory economic crisis. 
Cuba needed to give birth to the new man who alone, once rid of all individualism and capitalism, would be able to forge true communism. So he started making more speeches and stepped up his TV appearances. Para todos los que en el, en el frente del trabajo han demostrado su espíritu de sacrificio, su espíritu comunista, su nueva actitud frente a la vida, debe valer siempre la frase de Fidel que ustedes insertaron en uno de los palcos de este recinto. Los que fuimos en las horas de mortal peligro, sepamos serlo también en la producción. Sepamos ser trabajadores de patria o muerte. But in order to convince the people his ideas were fair, rather than debate endlessly and launch bold appeals, Che Guevara decided to put his ideas into practice and lead by example. There was no vanity here, no posing. These images didn't set out to create a new idol, to build a personality cult, or to act as communication, as we now call low-intensity propaganda. The Minister of Industries participated in the efforts of the people, and it was no play act. Because when the camera stopped rolling, Che kept on working. Although Che Guevara had lost the battle of the economy, he had clearly won the battle of the media, and his image shone forth. When in late 1964, Cuba was called on to address the new General Assembly of the United Nations, it was only natural that Fidel Castro should dispatch Che to New York. And his speech, broadcast live around the world, gave the general public the chance to discover a man who, on his own, appeared to embody the Cuban Revolution. Clama es patria o muerte. This was probably his moment of maximum public exposure in the international public eye. But just as he had become known to people everywhere, could finally speak to the media on behalf of peoples involved in struggles and put forward his own ideas on the international stage, like here in Algiers, his last public appearance, of which this is the only existing footage, all trace of him was suddenly lost. Che disappears from the world stage, suddenly. Here he is, a minister in this revolutionary government. He's been on the world stage. He's met with the world's leaders. He's called for action in Africa, Asia, Latin America. He's associated with guerrilla struggles around the world, and he suddenly disappears. It has often been said that the Soviet Union, which he had accused of being an imperialistic power just like any other, was behind his eviction from the leadership of the Cuban Revolution. It was also suggested although it's now known to be untrue, that a heated 40-hour argument with Fidel Castro had led to his hasty departure. In fact, we know very little. The one thing we are sure of is that for a long time, and especially once he believed the Cuban Revolution to be well consolidated, Che Guevara wanted to take up real arms again and continue the armed struggle against American imperialism. Che was gradually turning into a legend. While in previous battles his image was used as a weapon, his absence had now seemingly become an even bigger threat. His portrait, snapped by Porter the day after the Le Corbe explosion, was no longer representing a man, but a phantom. Los pueblos de América Latina cuentan con la experiencia, la capacidad y el talento de un hombre que se ha convertido en una de las más grandes pesadillas del imperialismo. El comandante Ernesto Che Guevara. His nickname was on everyone's lips. Everybody knew he was somewhere fighting, and of course spy agencies are looking for him. The reason he was so hard to track down was because his own image had become his main source of danger. So to avoid detection, Che needed to become anonymous again. First of all, in the Congo, where he had to keep a low profile. He was even forbidden from going to the front for fear that the color of his skin would betray his identity to the authorities. And then, when he arrived in Bolivia, a small country compared to its neighbors, 
but where, thanks to its five borders, a revolutionary triumph could cause the whole of Latin America to definitively topple, he had to abandon his typical appearance, drop his nickname, and even change his face. Chi's face was well known across the globe due to his media exposure. So, for safety's sake, he had to disguise himself, and he came up with a new look so nobody would recognize him. He had his teeth completely changed. He had his hair pulled out strand by strand so it wouldn't grow back too fast. It must have been painful. Before the amused eyes of Fidel Castro, the Cuban Secret Service, which Che had helped to found, transformed him. A suit and necktie, thick glasses, thinning white hair. The familiar face of the Argentinian revolutionary was replaced by that of a mundane and down-to-earth Uruguayan businessman called Ramon Benitez. But despite the talent of the Cuban makeup artists, his disguise finally wore thin. For after several months of guerrilla warfare up in the Bolivian mountains, Che Guevara had returned to normal, and word began to spread about him. It was a newspaper which first hinted at his presence and drew the attention of the Bolivian authorities and the CIA. The US-trained Bolivian Special Force was sent to track him down. After a battle in which 2,000 men attacked the remaining handful of guerreros still fit enough to fight, and despite their fierce resistance, Che Guevara was arrested. Taken to the village of La Jiguera, a last photo of him alive was taken. His captor was posed at his side, and then, on October 9, 1967, the day after his arrest, he was executed. His belongings were shared out, his body was put on display in a hospital laundry house, and the press was summoned to immortalize the event. Then, in a twist of fate, when his hands were amputated for fingerprint testing by the CIA, they were sent wrapped in a copy of that day's newspaper. These photos were seen worldwide. They prompted Fidel Castro to officially announce Che's death and the defeat of the Guerrero Heroico, live on Cuban TV. Because to erase the image of Che Guevara lying dead from the memory, the rebellious youth of 1968 chose to brandish the portrait of the Guerrero Heroico. And so it is that despite his surreptitious execution, the amputating of his hands for fingerprint testing, and his hasty burial next to an airfield runway, Che Guevara has become one of the greatest legends and icons of the 20th century. Because he continues to represent the very example of the complete revolutionary, ready to make every sacrifice to build a world of fairness and solidarity, an archetypal figure whom, for a while, capitalism thought it could accommodate, but who remains the living portrait not of revolt, but of revolution. Ahora sí, la historia tendrá que contar con los pobres de América, con los explotados y vilipendiados de América Latina, que han decidido empezar a escribir ellos mismos para siempre su historia. Ya se les ve por los caminos un día y otro, a pie en marcha sin término de cientos de kilómetros para llegar hasta los olimpos gobernantes a recabar sus derechos. Porque esta gran humanidad ha dicho basta y ha echado a andar. Y su marcha de gigantes ya no se detendrá hasta conquistar la verdadera independencia por la que ya han muerto más de una vez inútilmente.